Hey folks, how you all doing? Uh, me and my old mate Fluffy here have got some more music of the macabre to entertain you with. So let's get down straight to it. Hey Clue, Salem's Lot. Ooh, massively spooky TV mini series this. You guys all know it. And you pretty much know where I'm going to go with the music to this because it's very obvious. I know I said the other day I oh, weren't going to be so obvious with the, uh, my musical choices, but hey, you know, this is just so deliciously spine tingling and macabre that you, you've got to use it. You've got to put it in this series of terror tracks from Kiltman. So, you'll know the show. A Stephen King adaptation, a two part mini series, and this scared the bejesus out of everybody that watched it. David Soul was in it, and James Mason was in it playing the vampire Barlow's human muse who looks after him. Uh, but Barlow himself, the master, this European arch vampire demon lord, uh, was played by Reggie Nolder. And you see him there, you see the image of him there. Yes. And they'd gone for a very Nosferatu sort of look. The F.W. Merno Nosferatu. Rat-faced, rat incisors, and pointy ears, baldy head. And Reggie Nolder, who was a, actually a really, really good actor and a very cu cultured performer. Because of these hideous sort of um, facial burns that he, he had from a very early age, and his hollowed-in cheekbones, he was just destined to play monsters, you know, and, and, and villains. But he was good at it, you know? And even without any words, but with them glowing feral eyes and that hideous countenance, he struck the fear of God into everybody who saw that, that TV miniseries. Now, I'm going to play a couple of tracks. Well, three. I'm going to play three tracks. Hey, you know, I'm generous like that. And the score was done by a guy called Harry Suckman. Yes, it's a, a name you can play with there, but we're not going to go there. And he got the gig. He was quite old at the time when he got this. I think he was 69 years old when he got the gig for this. But it's because he, he'd worked on a, a TV movie the year before, in 1978, called Someone's Watching Me. Someone's Watching Me. It's a John Carpenter film. Yay! With um, his, his wife-to-be, Adrienne Barbeau, in it as well. And it's a great little TV thriller. You know, and we could see Carpenter's hallmarks were in there. But Suckman delivered the score, and it was ripe with suspense and tension. So that's how he got the uh, the job on Salem's Lot, which was directed by, of all people, Toby Hooper, the man behind Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and the man sort of behind Poltergeist. Well, he was there on set sometimes, but we all know that Spielberg did that movie and took over directorial chores. But as a favour, he gave you know, Toby Hooper the credit. Anyway, let's hear the main score to this. Now, I will say that the main score is inspired by the great Bernard Herrmann. And if you remember back to one of those glorious Ray Harryhausen stop-motion animation fantasy epics, The Seven Voyage of Sinbad, Sinbad will fight a, a skeletal demon on a spiral staircase and then through a laboratory in this warlock's domain. And the music is, for this main theme, very reminiscent of that. But anyway, the track's called Holy Water, but it is the main title. And you would hear it at the beginning. There's two episodes. You'd hear the beginning and the end of each episode. So you'd hear it four times throughout the entire show. And a resplendent theme it is too. I think you'll agree. Let's go with it.
quick credit sequence too. Black screen, and slowly you can see the old Myers house. Myers house, that's on Halloween. <laughs> the old Myers house. Where the vampire father will be spending his, his daylight hours. See, I can't get Halloween out of my brain. So, you all know the story. This European vampire is going to come over to this small main town of Salem's Lot, or Jerusalem's Lot, and he's going to, you know, systematically put the bite on everybody and infect the entire township and turn it into just a, a, a dead place that's just full of vampires, all his minions. And obviously, David Soul, Hutch from Starsky Hutch, uh, unusual casting there, but he's good in the role. Um, he's the writer who's from that town, but re returns home again after a, a long time away. Resumes with his old girlfriend from way, way you know, back in the past. And together with this lad called Mark, who was a horror, you know, aficionado, his bedroom is bedecked with universal monster horror posters. He's got masks everywhere. He's got props and models of graveyards and stuff like he's he's the kid that many of us possibly were and i know i certainly was and they will become these vampire battling you know this this duo and yeah the film has its tv soap opera moments but then again they were in the uh, the stephen king book as well stephen king why use one word when ten thousand will do you know and so many of his books were just they're great, but my God, they could be chopped down a bit. You know, this guy loved the sound of his own voice, a bit like somebody else I could possibly mention. I don't know who. Um, so it had all these elements too, to a three hour, um, overall three hour show. But its moments of horror were spine tingling. Genuinely aggressive as well. For, for a TV miniseries, this pushed a few boundaries and uh, None more so than the two poor kids who are vampirised, Ralph and Danny Glick, the Glick boys. First of all, Ralphie gets done, and then he dies, but he comes back to put the bite on his brother. And here we go. He'll visit him twice, and I'm going to play both tracks. First time, he comes to the bedroom in their house. And you remember it, the mist outside the, uh, the bedroom window. Ralphie comes floating up and he's literally floating in the air and it's just wow and he's his pale vampirized face sparkling eyes and the ksh, 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 on the glass to let you know, welcome him in let me in oh dear god <laughs> but listen to how Suckman Suckman's music becomes eerie ominous full of dread then full of a seductive quality which is to hypnotize the victim so he opens the doors opens the windows and lets him come in you know it's got to be slyly insidious it's got to be seductive but my god is it creepy let's get in there this track if i can find it <laughs> it's well it's called ralph is floating
is missed. Like the strings are like snakes. Raspy percussion. You felt the menace, you felt the sense of the supernatural, you know, this was powerfully uh, hypnotic stuff, you know, and of course, poor Danny doesn't die straight away, he ends up in hospital, whereupon he's going to get another visit from his vampirical brother, and uh, this is what's going to finally, you know, <laughs> literally put the final bite and the final nail in there, poor old Danny's coffin. So let's go for that. This one's called So Long Danny. Basically it's the same sort of track, but with even that far more added emphasis, more seductive, more sinister, because we know this time that this is this is his finale. So let's go for it. So long Danny. sense of the flowing of blood, the pounding of blood in the veins as well, with its rhythms and the weird percussion. Oh Danny. And of course what will happen in the film, the TV show, is that Danny will then be vampirised. He'll be turned. And he'll go for Mark, because Mark is the, the horror, the lad who's into the horror movies. Because they, they, they were mates anyway. And uh, he's going to try to go for him. And you get the same, you'll get the same music again. I'm not going to play it, because it's, that would be the third time you've heard it. Um, but what, what happens with that one? Because Mark knows his stuff. And at the last possible moment, just before, you know, he's going to 
succumb to this. He picks up, he's got this model of a graveyard, he'll pick up a, you know, a tombstone, a crucifix tombstone, and he'll ward off the vampire. Because he knows that's how to do it. And in that version, you will get, and I don't think it's as effective as what you've just heard, but it's still fantastic because because there's victory, there's human victory in that. You'll get uh, the, the Dyer's IRA will be in there, you know, feigned or you know, infamous, also almost devil's music. But you'll get the peeling of bells, and you'll get a sort of religious motif as well because he's well, Catholicism has won. You know, the crucifix has uh, turned away the evil, and I've got to say. That was just a brief one today, you know. I just thought I'd add a few, few more terror tracks to your, to your list, and it's well worth getting hold of this because, you know, there's a there's a double disc release from Intrada, one of my favourite record labels out there, and it's it's got everything on it, every bit of music made for it, plus tons and tons of extras. There is the the book that came with it. Yeah, it's a double CD, yeah, uh, and it's just sumptuous. And it has a lot of source music in it as well, like a bit of jazzy interludes, which they're easily programmed out. I mean, if you like them, that's great. But I do, I do find that when you're listening to it, particularly an album which is structured around the horror, that so, sometimes the source music, little tingly piano bits and jazzy, you know, lulls, kind of take you out of the atmosphere, you know. And so I just program them out and just keep with the suspense and the spine tingling. So, Salem's Lot by Harry Suckman. Yeah, make your own jokes up. Um, and in the meantime, keep it safe. Watch out for vampires. Don't open the windows when you hear scratching on that glass. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. So, folks, take it easy. Keep it Celtic. And I'm going to see you later.